Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday afternoon teaching video where we're striving to know what we believe and why we believe it. And here at Jubilee, we've been looking at the doctrine of eschatology through the lens of the Belgian Confession, Article 37. And we've already dealt with this for a number of weeks. We had a, a general introduction video about eschatology in general. We talked about uh, what happens when you die. What happens between when you die and the return of Christ? Then we had a session about the return of Christ. Last week we talked about the thousand year reign of Jesus, the millennium. And today we're going to be talking about the final judgment before the throne of God. What's going to happen when all the people are amassed in front of the throne of God? What is that judgment going to be like? And so let's dive right into that, and I'd like to do that by starting with Revelation chapter 20. So Revelation chapter 20, the verses 11 and 12 say this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. I don't know about you, but I think for a lot of us, the idea of the final judgment before the great throne of God actually sounds kind of scary. The whole concept of being judged before God could be kind of terrifying. And I think that there's something to that. In the great hymn, Day of Judgment, Day of Wonders, the first verse goes like this. Day of judgment, day of wonders, hark the trumpet's awesome sound. Louder than a thousand thunders, shake the vast creation round. How the summons will the sinner's heart confound. There will be something confounding, something even terrifying, scary about the last judgment. Especially when we read that phrase in Revelation 20, that the books will be opened and that the dead will be judged by what is written in the books according to what they had done. The idea that God has a record of everything that we've done. It's scary enough for some people when they think that Google has a record of all of the internet searches they've ever made in their whole life, all of their internet activity, but God has a record of every deed every thought, every word that we've ever done from the moment of our birth. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, We all have to appear before the judgment seat of the Christ, that each one might receive what is his due for what he has done in the body, whether it's good or whether it's evil. And so that can seem rather scary, rather confounding. At the same time, in Belgian Confession, Article 37, we confess that for the believer... The last judgment will be a source of great joy and comfort. For the believer, the last judgment before the throne of God is going to be full of great joy and great comfort for us. So on the one hand, it seems sort of scary and we're going to have to account for our deeds. On the other hand, we as a church confess that it's going to be full of great joy and comfort. So let's discover why it is going to be something full of great joy and comfort for the believer. And we'll do that by reading together Belgian Confession, Article 37. The last article of the Belgian Confession, the last judgment. And there we read this. Finally, we believe, according to the word of God, that when the time ordained by the Lord, but unknown to all creatures, has come, and the number of the elect is complete, our Lord Jesus Christ will come from heaven bodily and visibly as he ascended with great glory and majesty. He will declare himself judge of the living and the dead and set this old world afire in order to purge it. Then all people, men, women, and children who ever lived from the beginning of the world to the end will appear in person before this great judge. They will be summoned with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Those who will have died before that time will arise out of the earth as their spirits are once again united with their bodies in which they live. Those who will then be still alive will not die as the others, but will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from perishable to imperishable. Then the books will be opened and the dead will be judged according to what they have done in the world, whether good or evil. Indeed, all people will give account for every careless word they speak, which the world regards as mere jest and amusement. The secrets and hypocrisy of men will then be publicly uncovered in the sight of all. 
Thus, for good reason, the thought of this judgment is horrible and dreadful to the wicked and the evildoers. But it is a great joy and comfort to the righteous and elect. For then their full redemption will be completed, and they will receive the fruits of their labor and of the trouble they have suffered. The innocent will be known to all, and they will see the great vengeance God will bring upon the wicked who persecuted, oppressed, and tormented them in this world. The wicked will be convicted by the testimony of their own consciences and will become immortal, but only to be tormented in the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. On the other hand, the faithful and elect will be crowned with glory and honor. The Son of God will acknowledge their names before God his Father and his elect angels. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and their cause, at present condemned as heretical and evil by many judges and civil authorities, will be recognized as the cause of the Son of God. As a gracious reward, the Lord will grant them to, them to possess glory such as the heart of man could never conceive. Therefore, we look forward to that great day with great longing, to enjoy to the full the promises of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I'd like to, to point out a few things about the Last Judgment. Perhaps the most important thing to remember when you think about the Last Judgment is that Jesus will be the judge. That Jesus will be the judge. The Belgian Confession says that he, that is Jesus, will declare himself judge of the living and the dead. In Matthew 25, Jesus told his disciples that when he comes in glory with all the angels around him, he will sit on a glorious throne. And he says in John 5 that the Father judges no one, but has assigned all judgment to the Son. And so the apostles preach in Acts 10 that God has appointed Jesus as judge of the living and the dead. And then in Revelation, John can exclaim as he sees this vision, I saw a great white throne and to him that is Jesus who was seated upon it. And so we confess with the church of all ages and all places in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed that it is Jesus who will come to judge the living and the dead. And when you just pause and think about that, that it's Jesus who sits on the throne to judge the living and the dead, then you begin to understand the great comfort and the great joy that the believer will have on Judgment Day. As that, that hymn says in its second verse, See the judge, our nature wearing, clothed in majesty divine. You who long for his appearing, then shall say, This God is mine. Gracious Savior, own me in that day as thine. So the first thing to remember is Jesus is the judge. The second thing to understand is what do we mean by judgment? What exactly is Jesus going to be doing as the judge? And here it's important because we have a popular conception or a popular misconception that what will happen will be sort of a judgment, a little bit like a court case. Like uh, there was going to be an investigation into the, the life of the person and there's going to be a weighing of their good and their evil. And then there's, you know, that Jesus is going to determine whether or not they ought to be saved or, or, or punished. And then he will give a verdict. It's, it's sort of the, you know, the, the equivalent of all of those pearly gate jokes when someone arrives in heaven and they come before the pearly gates. And then there's sort of like this, this little mini court case and it gets decided based on, on what is said, what is testified as to where they're going to go. But you have to remember that really when all men and women, all humanity comes before the throne of God, there is not going to be any need for Jesus to do any investigation. There's not going to be a need for anybody to try to give a defense or try to convince the judge as to their worth. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of the sheep and the goats, and it's a parable about the last judgment. And he says that there, the Son of Man will separate the good from the evil. But the judgment will not be a holding a mini court case and hearing testimony to decide what the verdict will be. No, the judgment will be Jesus separating the sheep and the goats. That the, the final judgment in the great white throne will not be the giving of a verdict in a court case, but it will be a public declaration. It will be a public announcement issuing from Jesus himself, an announcement and then an application of the final state of every person. That Jesus will make a public announcement as to the final destiny, destiny of every person. And he's gonna do that in a way that gives glory to him as he sits on the throne. 
He's going to judge the wicked in a way that gives glory to him as God who is just, who gives people what they deserve. And he's going to judge the righteous in a way that gives him glory as the God who shows mercy, that doesn't count people's sins against them. And so that so Jesus is the judge. The judgment is not a, a verdict in a court case, but a public declaration and an application of the final des destiny of every person. And then the third thing to remember is that that declaration will be related to works. Because Revelation 20 says that the books will be opened uh, and that you know we will be judged according to our works. In fact, in the original Belgian Confession, when it speaks about the books being open, it says in brackets, that is the consciences. Our Canadian Reformed version of Article 37 has removed that phrase. But the books being opened, the consciences, the, the consciences of people, they will be judged on the basis of what their conscience says they have done. And that's just based on what the rest of Scripture says. In Matthew chapter 12, we read, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your works you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Or by your words you will be justified, and your words you will be condemned. Or Matthew 16, which talks about the Son of Man, is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he's going to repay everybody according to what they have done. It, there's going to be... Works are going to play a part there. The judgment or the public declaration of Christ on the great white throne will be related to the works of the person. John 5, Jesus says that he has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the son of man. Those who have done good to resurrection and life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And so if you look at the Athanasian Creed, which we can find in our, in our book of praise, one of the ecumenical creeds that we subscribe to, at the end of the creed, it says, At Jesus' coming, all men will rise with their bodies and will render an account for their deeds. And those who have done good will go to eternal life, and those who have done evil will go to eternal fire. Now, if you're sitting here listening to this, and you're somebody that's that's deeply entrenched in the doctrines of grace, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, then all of this talk of our judgment being based on works might seem a little bit strange. So let's look at that. Let's explain that by looking at what will happen before the great judgment seat of God, when the wicked come before God, and when believers, when the righteous come before God. So what happens when the wicked come before Christ at the great final judgment. Well, he's not there to, to weigh, see how things went. He's not there to, to issue out of a verdict after hearing testimony or after hearing a defense. We know that all people are born sinful. Psalm 51, 5. All people are guilty of Adam's sin. Romans 5. All of us are by nature objects of wrath. Ephesians 3. Belgian Confession Article 15 says that original sin, that is Adam's sin uh, that we live in, is so vile and abominable in the face of God that it's sufficient to condemn the whole human race. So the, the imputation of Adam's sin, the sin that we are, the original sin that we're all born with, that, that explains that we're unable to respond to God without regeneration, and it also explains how we are deserving of judgment. So in a certain case, you could say that the, the verdict has been out for a long time. We're all born objects of God's wrath. But here's the thing. When evildoers come before the throne of God, they will not be condemned on the basis of original sin. They won't be condemned on the basis of Adam's sin. The wicked are condemned, we confess in Article 37, on the basis of their own personal actual sins. And that comes just from what we read in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must appear before the judgment seat of God, that each one may receive his due for the things that they've done in the body, good or evil. Romans 1, 18, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Or John 3, Whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Or John 8, if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. So the application and the, the declaration of condemnation before the great throne of God will be based on the sinful, actual sin works of the wicked. 
John Calvin said it like this. He said, it's by personal and conscious acts of rebellion that the unsaved procure their own destruction. So the Belgian Confession says that the wicked will be convicted by the testimony of their own consciences. The wicked will be convicted on the basis of what they have done. And that's, that's not a minor point. That's an important point because the judgment of the wicked, uh, if the judgment of the wicked was done just on the basis of original sin, to have Jesus sit at the great throne of God, say, "Oh, you've you had Adam's sin in you, so you're uh, you know you you were born in, born in sin, so you're you're judged." That would seem unjust. So instead, the judgment is on the basis of their own works, their own sins, and so that is just. They get what they deserve, and so God is glorified as a just God. Now it's easy to take all of that as sort of from a, a almost a almost theoretical theological perspective but just pause for a moment and understand what great warning there is for those who have not turned to Christ for those who continue to live in the wickedness of their sin at his call the dead awaken rise to life from earth and see all the evil doers shaken by his looks prepare to flee Careless sinner, what will then become of thee? The warning is a serious one. That's what happens when the wicked come before the throne of God. Now let's talk about what happens when the righteous appear before the throne of God. And here something different happens. And here it's where it's so important to remember that it's Jesus that sits on the throne. That the judge, the person who will judge you at the end of days, bears the scars of the cross. We read it really beautifully in Lord's Day 19, question and answer 52. The question is, what comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? And the answer is this. In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. That's just beautiful. That the judge who sits on the throne is the very same person who already submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake. The Belgian Confession, Article 37, just says it like this. The Son of God will acknowledge their names, the names of the righteous, the names of the saved, before God his Father. And so 1 John 4, verse 17 says, We might have confidence for the day of judgment. It's Jesus who will judge us. And he's already taken the judgment of our sins upon himself, and he bears the scars to prove it. You could sort of think of, of Jesus on that throne of judgment, and you appear before him, and, and he could just quote Holy Scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? And there will be no answer. No one will be able to condemn us in those days. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised and he sits at the right hand of God and he intercedes for us. The judge that we await, as, that we await the judge from heaven, is the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God. It's a great comfort. So for the righteous, their name is written in the book of life. And Jesus Christ will say upon the throne, I know you. I know this person. You, this person, he or she is, is body and soul in life and death, mine. Also in this moment. The verdict for our sin, the verdict of the believer, has already been pronounced at the cross of Christ. When Jesus took our judgment, the judgment of all who believe, on himself, and then gave us his righteousness. It happened on the cross and in the hour where by the Holy Spirit we were regenerated and the salvation was applied to us. So the believer, if you're a believer already now, you are already in this life are justified. You are already in a right relationship with God. Jesus has already judged your sins. God has judged your sins on the cross and you're now found innocent. Spiritually, you're already seated with Christ in heaven. And the final judgment will just be a public declaration 
of that fact. The final judgment will be a public declaration and an application. Your redemption is now complete in every way. This person belongs to me. This person is innocent. The, the, the article of the Belgian Confession we're looking at says that in the final judgment, their full redemption will be completed. It's like your redemption will get that final stamp of approval. It's done. There's nothing left to be done. It's finished. So there's no court case. There's just a declaration of what is already true of you in Jesus Christ. The judgment of the wicked will glorify God's justice. They will get what they deserve. He will be just in his judgment. And then the judgment of the righteous will glorify God's mercy because it'll be a declaration of his mercy, his grace to sinners. But to those who have confessed, loved, and served the Lord below, he will say, come near, you blessed. See the kingdom that I bestow. You forever shall my love and glory know. There's one little question remaining after all of that good news is that, well, what about the works of the righteous? The books will be opened. Consciences will be examined. What about the works of believers? How will that play into the final judgment? Well, first of all, you know already that we're not saved by our works, that our works have nothing to do with obtaining salvation for us. And that will be true also on judgment day. Your works will play no role whatsoever in earning you or meriting you the final declaration of your salvation. Works for the Christian are proof that, uh, of salvation. It's the, the works are the proof that God has worked salvation in you. In the same way that if you have a, a fruit tree, the fruit of the tree does not make the tree alive. The fruit is proof that the tree is living. And in the same way, the works of the believer are proof that God has indeed regenerated the believer, regenerated the sinner, and caused him to be his own. So you can think of uh, what happens at the final judgment a little bit like this. God will open the books for unbelievers, and in those books will be a record of all of their sins, all of the deeds they committed without faith. And on that basis, God will condemn them, and so he will receive glory for his justice. And then in Revelation 19, we, we hear that, that the great multitude will sing, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to God, for his judgments are true and just. And then when believers come before him, the books also will be opened. The record of all of your deeds. But all of your sinful deeds will have been erased by the blood of the Lamb. And all that will remain will be the list of the good deeds, the good works which God in his grace allowed you to accomplish. The good works that are not proof of anything that you yourself have done without Christ, but are proof that Christ has indeed saved you and worked in you. And by his grace, you will be found worthy to be crowned with glory and honor at that moment, rewarded for those works. Revelation 19 says the song that will go up is hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. And then it says this, it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And as a gracious reward, the Lord will grant glory as the heart of man cannot conceive. So when you think about the final judgment before the great white throne of God, brothers and sisters, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't need to be a scare, scared. You don't need to be confounded. The judgment will not be scary. It will not be scary at all. Live your life in a way that strives and is zealous for good works. Fight against sin in your life. But know this, when the books are opened in the last day, all your sins, all my sins, will have been erased away by the blood of the Lamb. All your good works, all the things that God has allowed you to do by the grace of his Holy Spirit, those will be shown publicly as evidence that, yes, Jesus was working in your life, and he made you a child of God, and he allowed you by his grace to work out that salvation through good works. You've got nothing to fear. So instead, as the Belgian Confession says, look forward to that great day with great longing to enjoy the full promise of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So I'd, I'd like to close uh, this piece of teaching with the words of Psalm 98. Psalm 98 is this, this psalm of praise and psalm of longing for the great judgment of God. And I'm going to read to you the rhymed version as it's found in the book of praise. Sing to the Lord a new song voicing for mighty wonders he has done. His right hand and his arm most holy, the victory for him have won. The Lord has blessed us with salvation, his righteousness he, has he made known. He has revealed to all the nations that justice issues from the throne. He has remembered all his mercy, his faithfulness to Israel. Our God was everywhere triumphant. The whole wide world saw him prevail. Let all then gather to adore him and his victorious might proclaim. Now make a joyful noise before him. Let all creation praise his name. Let all the earth with loud rejoicing burst into song to praise the Lord. With joyful blasts of horns and trumpets, let him be worshipped and adored. Join in the praise and jubilation. Make music with the harp and sing. Shout forth your joy and celebration. Come, praise the Lord, the mighty King. Let seas and oceans roar and thunder. Praise God, all you who dwell on earth. Let rivers clap their hands rejoicing. Let every mountain shout with mirth. He comes. He comes to rule the nations. And every wrong he will redress. The mighty God of our salvation will judge the world in righteousness. Oh, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Amen. Thanks for joining me for this video. May the Lord bless you as you strive to know what you believe and why you believe it.